Lori's first up and, and she's uh, pulling up Zoom now, so she'll get started here in just a minute. Okay, Lori, are you are you on and set? I'm here. I was just watching for the, the number of participants to stabilize there as people are popping on. So good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, as some people have already started to do, if you'll chat an introduction of who you are into the chat box. We, um, as Amy mentioned, we have a tight agenda, so we don't have time to go kind of round robin intros, but um, we can all know who each other are that way. Um, if you'll just housekeeping, remember to keep yourself on mute if you're not talking. Um, we love to see your faces, so cameras on is great, um, but if you end up with any sort of weird problems with like audio, video being delayed, you might try turning your camera off. Sometimes that helps. Um, so uh, we are excited uh, about this webinar series. This is the first of three webinars we put together on electric school buses. Uh, this is a topic that was was kind of brand new to our region last April and has now hit a um, a really exciting kind of point of traction. So excited to share more information about that with everybody. Um, our next one will be in, in a couple weeks and then we'll finish up in January. Um, next slide, Amy. Um, so in case uh, you are not familiar with who we are, so my name is Lori Clark. I'm a program manager here at the North Central Texas Council of Governments, which is our regional planning agency. We cover 16 counties. Uh, we also serve as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which means we do regional transportation planning. And because we have an ozone non-attainment problem in the counties shown in pink, we are required to do air quality planning as part of our transportation work, which means we do a lot of work on clean vehicle type activities, including alternative fuels. Um, and we house the Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities Coalition to, to fulfill that role. So that's who we are. Um, I do want to uh, quickly introduce and acknowledge um, Amy Hodges and Sedan and Nance on our staff. They really have done all of the work putting all of this together. So they've done an excellent job. Really excited to see what they've got for all of us today. Um, and the next two sessions. So great job to them. And also thank you to all of the other organizations that we've collaborated with. So that includes utilities, state agencies, a couple um, advocacy groups and um, our peers around the state, which I'll introduce in a moment. Next slide. Um, so just a little bit about Clean Cities. If you don't know who Clean Cities is and what we do, it is a national program under the Department of Energy. Um, our job is to <clears throat> kind of be the boots on the ground locally, connecting fleets in particular with different um, solutions that can help reduce their emissions footprint, their um, energy consumption, their uh, fuel consumption, all of those types of things. And so you can see here the measures that we use to do that. Um, so all of these are, are in our portfolio of work. Next slide. And then this is the impact nationally of the Clean Cities organization. So 10 billion um, gasoline gallon equivalent of petroleum have been reduced, over 1 million alternative fuel vehicles on the road. Um, and so, of course, electric school buses fit to um, this world of impact. Next slide. Um, so through the Clean Cities program, we provide all of um, information through information and tools, also technical assistance one-on-one. -on -one. There are grant opportunities, but also training um, and partnerships. And so I just encourage you to look at us as the Clean Cities Coalition as your key to this universe of information. So we have a network of national labs that support us. 
and a network of almost 100 peers around the country. So if there's a question that you as a fleet um, have, or as a school district representative that, that has a fleet <laughs> working with you, um, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to let us know. And we may not have the answer, but we probably know who does. And so we can ferry those questions up the chain. Next slide. Um, so here, we are here in Dallas-Fort Worth, but you have one of us, most likely, in your backyard. Um, so in the Austin area, uh, your regional planning agency is the Capital Area COG, and the Clean Cities Coalition is Lone Star Clean Fields Alliance. So I wanted to share those um, names and points of contact. Andrew, Christiane, and Elizabeth are great. Uh, we work with them very frequently um, in Houston. Uh, Andrew DeCandis and he, his team, including Gilbert and um, oh, Ben. Um, so at Houston Galveston Area Council and Houston Galveston Clean Cities. And then in San Antonio, you've got Lyle at Alamo Area COG, Alamo Area Clean Cities. So um, in Austin, you've got uh, multiple organizations to work with. The rest of us um, happen to be kind of in the same umbrella. Next slide. So with that, um, we have, a, as we mentioned, um, a packed agenda. Uh, so wanted to give you just that quick overview, kind of orientation to uh, who we are, what we're about, and why we put this together. We'll turn it over to John Hall to talk about um, the benefits of electric school buses. And then uh, we have a couple OEMs represented today and um, with an assist from the infamous Jason Gillis at Everman ISD. And then Encore will uh, talk about kind of that integration with utilities. We've got some time for general Q&A. And then we will continue in the next couple of webinars. Go to the next slide. Um, we will have more OEM presentations in um, two weeks, along with discussion from energy managers about the considerations. You know, once you start plugging fleet vehicles into buildings, like that introduces a new dynamic. And then in January, we'll wrap up with some discussion on funding, which is everybody's favorite topic. And yes, that is strategic on our end. We try to keep you um, engaged all the way to the money. So uh, with that, I will turn it over. Um, Amy, if you don't mind kind of facilitating the, the rest of the way with introductions to everybody. Um, but I think next up is John Hall. Yes. Um, is everyone able to hear me OK? I. Uh... Yes. Savannah, can you confirm? I don't believe John Hall is on the, the call. I don't see him unless he dialed in. So. Okay. John, if you're there, um, please unmute yourself and, and speak up. Okay. Um, so it's not like us to let five minutes go by without sharing something with you. So I was prepared to share something with you in case uh, John wasn't able to join us. Um, I did want to share, our, our good friends at TxDOT um, shared this with us. Um, they tasked um, the Texas A&M Transportation Institute uh, with conducting a literature review and industry scan of electric school buses. And um, we were, um, I think we're, we'll probably post this online and send links out and have it available. Um, and then we can certainly email it as an attachment and what have you. There's a lot of um, good information here. And I believe um, Brittany and John Overman are actually on the call. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to take a quick few minutes. I um, only have five minutes. So I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of slides. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight the benefits um, at a, at a very high level, um, the main benefit being reducing emissions, and that can provide a safer, cleaner environment for children. Uh, uh, the buses are very quiet, uh, and they also have fewer, fewer parts, so that gives them potential, the potential for lower maintenance costs. Uh, one slide I wanted to um, share is uh, this background. Um, according to the American School Bus Council, uh, approximately 480,000 school buses transport nearly 25 million students in the U.S. each day. In Texas, 30,541 school buses are in operation, were in operation during the 2018 to 2019 school year. Uh, they are classified as zero emission vehicles. 
and that can reduce the potential for adverse health effects for school children from exposure uh, to bus tailpipe and engine pollutants. And there's about 65 electric school buses currently deployed uh, across the United States. Uh, another benefit is, uh, you know, the price of the fuel. So this chart is showing, um, you know, the comparison of propane, diesel, CNG, and electricity. Electricity is shown there in blue, uh, on the, the bottom line in blue. Uh, so this is, you know, kind of converted over to gasoline gallons equivalents because um, electricity is in uh, per kilowatt hour. But the average, um, and so th these fuel prices um, were for comparison purposes taken off of the Alternative Fuels Data Center site in January of 2020. Uh, that was the most current data available at that point. Um, the average price for diesel was $3.05 per gallon. The average price for propane was $2.79 per gallon. CNG was $2.18 per gasoline gallon equivalent. And the average price for electricity was 13 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, shown here on the chart, uh, converted to gasoline gallons equivalent. The other point of this chart is to show uh, how stable uh, the price of electricity is in comparison to these other fuels. So you can see the other lines are, are varying quite widely. Another uh, potential um, benefit is uh, the vehicle to grid and vehicle to building technology. Um, so bi-directional connections allow electric buses to not only receive power, but also give power back either to the grid itself or to a building. Uh, electric school buses have a unique ability to provide power back to the grid. They have limited range and are sitting idle for extensive periods of time during which they could be collecting revenue. Uh, the infrastructure is new, uh, and the exact cost for the charging structure is unknown, but it's expected to be much higher than the um, AC level two or DC fast chargers. So the two types of technology are vehicle to grid and vehicle to building. And with vehicle to grid, uh, it's growing in popularity um, as utility providers are teaming with schools to incorporate electric school buses. Um, utility companies are often helping to offset the higher costs of the school buses in return for the use of school buses as energy providers to the grid to offset a uh, high demand for electricity. To see enough benefit, there would need to be several buses. Uh, a single bus wouldn't, would not be able to provide enough energy to justify the process. There is a concern that utilizing vehicle to grid could cause wear on the batteries and even shorten the battery life. Utilizing vehicle to grid would ultimately require an extremely reliable management program. As the management would be time intensive and more than a school district could manage, it would likely fall on the utility provider or a third party. So I'm, I've used up my five minutes and I'm going to uh, pass it on uh, but anyway, this was a very interesting um, study, and I am going to turn it over. And we were, like I said, we're very willing to share the information with you, and I'm going to turn it over. So next we have um, Ray Randall and, and Bill Maurer. Okay, thank you. i share my screen. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, my name is Randall Ray. I'm with IC Bus, the director of uh, new new business development. And with me today is Bill Marr, our vice president from InCharge, our infrastructure and financing solution partner. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, talking to you today, and want to say thank you, of course, to uh, to our host, the. Uh, North Central Texas governments and the uh, DFW uh, Clean Cities Group. So without further ado, we'll move ahead. And let's go. 
on side. Hold on. There we go. So we'll talk very briefly about uh, the market drivers. We'll talk about where Navistar and IC bus is. And then we'll obviously give a little bit about the bus itself. And then what uh, Bill will talk about our infrastructure uh, capabilities and really kind of the process that, that happens there. Um, Amy talked a lot about the, uh, the infrastructure and, and around those needs and, and Bill does an excellent job on that. So, uh, so we look forward to uh, hearing him on those as well. So as was pointed out earlier, um, you know, why, why electric? And it really is as, as indicated, it's such a positive impact on the students, the community and the environment that that really can't be denied at this point. To the point that, you know, um, there's enough momentum within the industry, within, you know, as, as mentioned, the funding opportunities that are coming, that even the early adopters are going to succeed. You know, there's been some feints in this with hybrids, you know, 10 years ago, and even some electrics many years ago. But really now that momentum and the capability has arrived. And the benefits are, are obviously plain with zero emissions. And then again, as mentioned uh, by Amy, the benefits just in, in the vehicle transportation department itself, the savings and the simplicity that comes along with the EVs. So our industry is having a, a lot of changing demographics, uh, both at the user level and within the industry itself and the transportation departments and the manufacturers. Environmental concerns, as we know and read every day in the newspaper, continues to grow. And the change in technology and growth in technology is really um, pervasive in every part of our life. And if you really think about also, you know, one of the little bullet points on the right side is how do you increase ridership? So if we can make a better bus, a better bus for the students, a better bus for the environment, a better bus for the community, well, then now we've started to make incentives where we can help increase that ridership and let everybody benefit uh, from that electric vehicle technology revolution, really. That's occurring. So at Navistar, we have started, we've not started, but we have a new group dedicated to the electrification of our vehicles. Uh, that's next up in Detroit, Michigan, and uh, their, uh, their newest ad. And we're also uh, we're talking to the folks in Texas. We're also building a brand new truck plant in San Antonio. Um, so we're excited about that. But like I say, the group in next, it's all they do is electrification of our of our buses and trucks. And quite frankly, the school buses are leading at Navistar. They will be our first electric vehicles launched. Um, we'll be deploying our first ones uh, come January up in British Columbia. Uh, that was chosen direct or um, directly or on purpose because, quite frankly, it gives us every terrain and every environment within a relatively concise area from coastal plains and, and temperate, uh, uh, temperate um, uh, ambient temperatures to the mountains, the snow, and, uh, and the brutal cold that, uh, that is often associated with Canada. So we're very excited about that. Um, the picture on the lower right there is our uh, is a diagram of what the Texas San Antonio plant is going to look like, and our first vehicle planned off that will be an electric truck. So again, um, we're we're all in with a new new folks uh, and new plants. Not the that, that that plant is not dedicated, um, but it will be dual capable of both normal vehicles and the electrics, as will our Tulsa bus plant where we build today. So there's a lot of technology in the industry. And really, when you think about technology, technology really should assist a stakeholder. So everything that you see there, you can equate it over to, to the right-hand side is, okay, who does that really benefit and how many different stakeholders can it benefit? And the more benefits or the more stakeholders each one, then obviously that will help drive the adoption rate. If you can benefit the community and the drivers and the transportation department, um, that's going to help drive something that might be just a singular benefit. Maybe it's just transportation or just dispatch. So you can see how, how the more, the more advancements and how they benefit more stakeholders really helps move that over into an adoption rate. So that kind of moves us up to the bus itself. Uh, we have three different battery sizes, um, 105 kilowatts, 210 and 315 respectively. And that equates to mileage ranges. So, whether it's you know, a, a short, mid, or long, uh, we now have that type of capability. And 
quite frankly, at 315, it's the uh, largest in the industry and therefore the, the longest uh, route capability as well with over 200 mile capabilities. The bus itself, has been, as Amy talked about, we are V to G ready. The bus is ready for that. Um, we have both level two and what's called a, a direct current fast charge capability. You can see the uh, CCS1 combo charger in the port um, there in the center of it. Uh, we offer two charge port locations and we run air disc brakes. One thing that we do have unique is we do have three levels of regenerative braking available, you know, low, medium, and high. And after driving them, quite frankly, just put it in high and call it a day. But we do have that capability for that can be tailored to the individual routes. Uh, like all of our buses, electronic stability control is standard. And then some of the options or what we have are over on the right hand side. Um, uh, then they're all direct drive. So we have lift bus, we have route bus, and of course for Texas, we have air conditioning available as well. Safety of course is, uh, is paramount whenever on any sort of vehicle. Um, school buses obviously have their own unique rules and regulations that we always comply with. And now we're adding some, some additional levels with the high voltage. So we have both high voltage, low voltage disconnects, uh, service disconnects, um, all, all working in, in conjunction with uh, uh, being able to make it a safe environment. Uh, high voltage components, uh, we have AC DC converter, the vehicle control and power steering and air compressor are all um, high voltage as well. So really from a transportation department uh, viewpoint is the simplicity that comes with it is, is stunning. When you really think that all of your maintenance, not all, sorry, um, the majority of their maintenance deri is derived from the internal combustion engine. Um, combustion creates byproducts and that's all part of the after treatment system. There's fuel usage that obviously we talked about earlier and the prices of fuels, but the electric vehicle really takes all that maintenance away, leaving really cooling for the batteries, cooling for the high voltage, brakes and chassis. Um, all that internal combustion engine stuff obviously goes away because it's literally not there. So that really creates savings and simplicity, uh, probably more simplicity than anything else uh, for, the, uh, for the transportation. As we get to it, infrastructure is huge and how we approach that. So I'm gonna let Bill from uh, In Charge take over here as uh, he's got some great information for us as well. Yeah, yeah. so this, is, this next slide um, really talks about what our process is and kind of going through it. It is a long process, so everybody that's even thinking about it, you know, it can take you anywhere from eight to 18 months to kind of go through that process between infrastructure, ordering the buses, get, getting the buses. So it's very important to start this process early in, in your decision making. Um, these are really what we look at as the five C's. Um, the first one is on the consulting side, you know, really going through your routes, going through where you're going to be parking them that has a big part of logistics of when you're putting the charging systems in, et cetera. The second piece is the charging side of it, sizing the, the right systems that are coming in, the main power coming in. Um, that is usually the place, you know, where in, in my opinion that we're all the districts that we're working with right now are probably the most nervous about. Um, it's something that they, they know buses, they know how to drive the buses obviously, but putting that charging system in and that infrastructure is usually an area where they get a little bit nervous and they're not too sure. And that's really something when you're working with IC bus and, and in charge that we provide that turnkey solution. Um, again, on the construction side, going through, putting all the, all the uh, charging stations in, putting in the buses, et cetera. That's a big, big proponent of it. But that, that planning piece of it, if you take anything away from this conversation in regards to the infrastructure, it's that planning stages and, and making sure you have all that lined up before you order the buses, because how what bus you order, whether you know, hopefully it's IC bus, but all of our everybody's a little bit different in regards to their charging capabilities. So you want to make sure you plan that up front. Um, on the connectivity side, again, it's a turnkey solution. So when we put the chargers in, we charge, hook them up to the buses, we do all the, the commissioning of the units, et cetera. So again, it's a turnkey solution for you with very limited risk on, on that piece for you. And probably the most important thing um, right now, obviously with the environment and environmental concerns is the conservation side. So we have a detailed plan in regards to 
what we're going to do. You know, the battery life, as Randy mentioned earlier, is, is eight years, 170,000 miles. But those batteries are going to be old after eight years. So we have a detailed plan. Um, uh, just because of time, we're not going to get into all of it. But there's a very detailed plan on what we're going to be able to do with those batteries, recycle them, reuse them, repurpose them for different opportunities. Um, it's not so much that the battery itself is dead after eight years. It's just not going to have the capabilities that, that it has as a brand new battery. I, I equate it very similar to your iPhone or your, your Samsung, whatever phone you have. You know, the first year that you have your phone, your battery lasts for you know, two years, three years or two days, three days. And by the time after one year or two years, it starts going and you have to start charging every day. And then it's maybe twice a day, et cetera. So very similar with these batteries, obviously a lot longer life cycle, but the process is about the same. So we have a very detailed plan on what to do with those batteries after the fact. Go ahead, Randy. There it is. Um, so which charging system, again, this is probably an area that most school districts are, will struggle with a little bit, and that's what we're here to help you with. The AC level one is really just your residential, right? So um, you're never going to use an AC level two um, in any of your districts. It's very slow, um, very <laughs> process orientated, if you will, um, on that piece of it. Um, the AC level two, you can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to charge for every hour. If you look on the chart on the right, on the very far right, you're going to get anywhere from 10 to 20 miles per hour, depending on which AC level two charger you, you install. Um, that's a, usually a good opportunity. That's the long term where you're going to plug the bus in and, and leave it in, leave it plugged in for six, eight hours at a time. Um, the DC fast chargers, there's a lot of different options on that. And to be honest, the technology increases on a, on a monthly basis, it seems like almost right now. But you literally can get 80% of your charge in, in less than an hour. Um, on full uh, on one of the larger DC systems. So uh, again, the, the, the big caveat to the electric bus over the past, you know, whatever, five, seven years has been the range. And right now you can run a bus for 100, 125 miles per route and still be able to, to make that with the electric where, you know, before, whether it was 40 miles, 60 miles, that should really be taken out. Now, there's probably one or two school districts that I'm in on the phone that might have a range of 120 miles per route, but most of the time they're you know 50, 80 max. Um, so these electric buses are, are going to work very well for you guys in regards to um, uh, meeting those range requirements. You can bring them back to the yard and charge them up. So I talked about the process at the beginning on the charging stage. And this, again, this is really something that if you're going, if you're thinking about going electric, it's a very simple process, but it's a detailed process in regards to what needs to be done. So gathering the site information, utility bills, and the biggest thing is understanding what power you have coming into your transportation center or wherever you store your buses. So we will typically do a site walk. We'll walk around, look at what your power requirements are, talk to you, evaluate what your bus routes are, what your current parking situation is, um, what your current power usage is, what we're gonna need on how, depending on how many buses and not just short-term, um, but mid-term and long-term. So if you're gonna be buying you know, 10 electric buses right now, but the plan is by 2025 to get to 50, we need to know that up front, and we need to plan for that up front. and putting those at, at a bare minimum, running the conduit, running the wire, because once you go through that and you go through the the utility company to get that upgrade, you don't want to have to do that again because typically that's the long process. When you're working with the utilities and you, you go up and you tell them you need a whole new main service coming in, it can take eight months to a year, sometimes even longer, depending on the utility, just to get that service in. So we want to do this one time. So again, planning this process up front is, is extremely important uh, for anybody that's uh, looking into going electric. Um, so we'll kind of go, we went, we'll go through a little bit. We did a preliminary plan. We kind of review that with you and we prevent you present the, the estimates, et cetera. But again, the main thing I want everybody to understand, if you're, if you're considering going electric at a bare minimum, start looking at your infrastructure piece of it, um, because that is usually what the, the main holdup is going to be. If you order the bus and the bus shows up and then you start thinking about what type of power requirements are going to be needed, you're, you're going to run into some uh, pretty, pretty tough issues.
Go ahead, next slide. So this is this is a basically a fleet management software that's included with the IC bus. Um, so we go through and we develop, it's a software base, so anybody can access it, obviously password protected, um, but it's a really a, a great opportunity and a great system for you guys to evaluate where your fleet is at electrically. Um, you know, you don't want to be able to, if you got 50 buses, you don't want to have to run around and look at each bus and see which, which bus has how much charge, which bus, if you have a bus that's come in from the afternoon run, and you want to take it to you know the football game on Friday night, the, the visitor's place, and it's 60 miles, you don't know which bus. This takes care of all that. Um, go ahead, the next slide, Randy. So this shows you what the charging capability or what the charge is on each bus. It tells you, it tells you how many buses are charged, how many but you know what the charge capability is. The, the one in the middle kind of talks a little bit about what's available. That's basically at 100 percent The one in the green talks about charging. Um, the one on the, the yellow is saying it's connected, um, probably at a very low charge. And then you can see, which is just as important, the red, there's two buses that are plugged in but aren't being charged. So we can basically analyze that and say, okay, we got to go find, go get, go to these two buses and find out exactly what's going on and why they're not charging. So you don't go to use it in the morning and have an issue. This is probably the, 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 I'll say the fleet management, and these are all a part of the same software. These are just different dashboards and these are all very customizable. Um, but this is probably the one that's most utilized by our clients. And what this shows you, you can see the buses on the right and it's almost like an alkaline battery, if you, if you will. So the buses are showing you which bus has the most charge, which buses have the least charge. So back to my scenario again, if you needed to take a bus to a football game on Friday night, you could look at you could basically look at this at a real quick snapshot and say, okay, I need I'm, we're going to take bus 13. It's fully charged, ready to go. It can make it there and there and back. You don't have to go out into your parking lot and kind of evaluate which bus. So it really gives a, a great efficiency into or a great eye into your system or into your fleet and be able to provide which bus so you're not running around seeing which one is available. So we talked a little bit about the, the funding side and there's a lot of different options out there. Again, there's probably the biggest, you know, obviously the grants and the rebates help fund this and the V2G is a, a great opportunity. There's a lot of question marks on the V2G. I'm not gonna talk too much about that right now, um, but it can be a very good viable opportunity. Um, we provide the V2G um, through partners, um, the V2G capabilities. Um, but ultimately, you're going to need some sort of financing mechanism for your buses. Um, so there's really three different options. The finance direct is basically your typical, almost, you know, like you're going out and buying a car. It's a capital purchase and you pay for it over a five to seven year term. You get the depreciation and you own the equipment. The second option that we're, we're starting to do is basically very similar as in, in a school related is a printer lease where you're basically going out, you're, it's a lease, it's a long-term lease, seven to 10 years. Um, you actually don't own the, the bus until after the end of the, the lease. These are typically seven to 10 years. Um, and at the end of 10 years, you have that option to either buy the bus or go out and get a new bus. So you're not provide, you don't have to provide any capital on, at, in any of these scenarios, at least the operating lease and the one I'm about to talk about. There's no upfront capital from the school districts it's basically set up as a lease and we can finance it over a certain period of time. Um, the, the, the next option, and, and this is actually the option that's really starting to also get, get some feet and we're getting a lot of uh, interest in it, is the third party ownership. So we'll ba basically own and maintain the bus for the school district. You are basically paying on a per mile basis. So there's absolutely no capital outlay um, we're basically, you're reallocating the money from your operational and fuel savings. As Randy mentioned before, there's a 75%. That's probably a, on the higher end, but we're seeing right now anywhere from 60 to 75% of the operational savings. And then Amy talked about the fuel savings, the cost of the fuel, whether it's propane or diesel or natural gas or gas, there's a significant amount of fuel savings. Um, so really what you're doing is you're reallocating those funds from your operational and fuel savings and you're paying, and you're basically paying on a per mile basis. So for example, um, we're, it's typically monthly payments. So it, all the buses have recorders in them when they charge up, they know how many KW use, which equates to miles. And basically you get charged, whether it's a monthly or quarterly, we've got both, both two different types of contracts out there, um, really depends on what's ideal for the client. 
Um, these are obviously much longer term deals, um, a minimum of 10 years, 15 years is, is max, but we're kind of seeing that 10 to 12 year range kind of falling in, into play for most of our clients. But th this is a great, great opportunity if you're looking to get into the electric bus world um, and you don't want, you don't either A, have capital or you don't want to use that capital toward the electric bus, you can use it, you can utilize this type of scenario and you can reallocate that capital. So if you have you know, two million, three million dollars set aside for your new electric fleet, you can basically do this per mile basis and pay for it over time and reallocate that capital towards smart boards, et cetera, something with, that goes towards the education of the kids. Uh, Bill, um, oh, so I'm I'm happy you're toward the end of your presentation. Yeah. Um, we really I was need watching the. I have I have a little timer. I was watching. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, yeah. So we would really like to open it up for questions before we move on. Um, so I know we have several ISDs on the line. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions of uh, Randall and Bill. So anyone, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, this is Chris from Austin ISD. Hi, Chris. Hi, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. I'm in the office, so we are required to wear the mask. So. Yeah, oh, good. Um, uh, yeah, a couple of questions. I've been, you know, we are interested to pilot, um, still looking for the funding. Um, the battery cost, well, first of all, how long would the batteries last and what would be the replacement cost? So that's a great question. So the, the batteries themselves have an eight year non-conditional warranty. So they're gonna last for eight years or 170,000 miles. So the eight years is probably the more realistic warranty, the 170,000 miles, unless you're running really extensive bus routes, um, you're, you're gonna hit the eight years before you, find, before you hit the 170,000. So you won't have to worry about the battery um, cost, replacement cost for that first eight years. The, the short answer is it's very difficult, and I'm sure all, all the other OEMs will agree with me, it's very difficult to put a price on what the battery is going to cost in eight years because of technology, the size of the batteries, everything's going to be different. Um, so it's very hard to say whether it's going to be you know, $20,000 a battery or $12,000 because these, these batteries, obviously the, the technology has come a long way just in the last three years. So in eight years, it's extremely difficult to, you know, if, if you had to say $20,000 per battery and there's three batteries, so it'd be $60,000 to replace the batteries right now. But the bottom line is in eight years, for you won't have to worry about it for eight years. And in eight years, my guess is that the cost is going to come, not only the cost, but the efficiency, you're going to get more KW on a smaller battery in eight years. So um, it, I, I'm, I, I really can't answer the question for eight years. Um, but if you do the, the, we do have the extended warranty on that one program I talked about, whether it's the operating lease or the cost per mile, we put an extended warranty um, inside of our program. So you wouldn't have to worry about it, whatever the term of that lease or the, uh, the per mile basis would be. Okay. I have, I have a couple more, if y'all don't mind, then I'll be quiet. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so, so we talked about 100 to 120 miles on on average. I mean, we have some, um, um, yeah, we are averaging about 80 to 100, but, but we do have routes that they go 100 to 120 miles a day. If, and we put AC on big buses. So if you put AC on the big buses, and you know in Texas, you're gonna be running AC for probably six, seven months a year, how would that change? Uh, the, the AC would not degrade the batteries whatsoever. The AC would obviously just impact what that range was on that day. Okay. And, and AC is not as much of an impact as heat. So uh, with judicious driving, you know, you'll be fine. Um, you okay. know, exactly, you know, if it's cranked up from every, from moment A to moment N, I, you know, obviously we don't know. But um, it, obviously there is an electric draw and that would take away from, from that range. And, um, but that's also why we have, you know, three levels of regen. So, you know, that can be optimized to its best capability and would just have to be tailored to, you know, each and every, each and every route. Okay. And with the cost of 
and and you know the last one with the cost of the buses about 320 to 350 at this time what would be the roi and how long will it take i i don't have that number um, so, uh, yeah i i can walk you through that a little bit chris so the R, the roi is going to depend it 100 on how much you're driving the bus right so and the age of your bus so if, if you have you know, I'll say you we call it the dirty dozen, right? So if you have your top 12 buses, if you sent us that information, you know, what the age of the bus is, how much it's driving, you know, what the average bus route is per day, I, and whether it's natural gas or diesel or, or whatever the situation is, we can run those ROIs on you pretty, pretty quickly. So obviously the more you're running the bus, the longer the route, you know, if you're doing a hundred mile, you know, if you're doing a hundred mile route, um, it's going to have a way better ROI than one that's running 40 miles a day, right? Okay. So if we can easily provide that for you and show you what the different models would look like for each bus. Um, but it, it'll it'll vary depending on, on the route's the biggest the biggest uh, factor, obviously. I appreciate you. I have Thank to. You. I, I need to step in right now. We need to move on. Uh, we that's will fine. time at the end for questions, um, just we for everyone. And uh, I appreciate if everyone could just hang in. Uh, the Zoom meeting will not end. It will keep going uh, if we want to, if those of you want to keep, keep on the call uh, for, for a longer question session at the end. Okay, so Albert, uh, take it away. Thank you, Amy. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Just a moment. Okay, I think everyone can see that okay? Yes. All right, good deal. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Burley. I am the Regional Executive Director from Bluebird, um, responsible for our uh, electric uh, school bus products, and real happy to be here with you this morning to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, with me today, I'm gonna also have Mark Trahan from Nuvi Corporation uh, to talk uh, a little bit about uh, vehicle to grid. They've uh, developed our uh, V to G capability on our bus. And also uh, we'll have Jason Gillis from Everman ISD who took delivery of three of our buses um, just a couple of months ago and wants to share kind of his experience thus far and talk about some of the savings they're experiencing um, already. So let me go ahead and get started. So at Bluebird, uh, we consider ourselves the uh, really the alternative power experts. Uh, we've sold over 20,000 alternative power school buses to over 900 school districts, and we sell buses and various powers, diesel, of course, but propane, gasoline, compressed natural gas, and now electricity. And we were actually the first to market uh, with an EV product, actually going back to 1994. Um, on the screen here, these are actually our brochures from that time back in 94 when we launched this bus. Um, it was honestly probably a little bit before its time. The battery technology is not what it is today. Uh, we didn't keep this product product for more than a few years. It was we probably sold about 35 or so in four or five different states and uh, decided to discontinue at the time. Learned a lot about electrification of school buses during that time. Um, but just want to say, you know, we do have kind of a a long, rich history of electrification going back uh, quite a few years. But more importantly, kind of where are we today? Well, if you uh, look back at 2016, that's kind of when we got back into uh, electrification of school buses. We received a grant from the Department of Energy uh, to develop um, uh, high-powered V2G school buses. And one year later in 2017, we actually launched that product and showed it at the STN Expo in Reno, Nevada. Uh, in 18, we delivered our first electric powered school buses to some customers in California and kind of jumping ahead to 2020, kind of where are we today? Uh, well, right now we're the only manufacturer to have produced and deployed electric school buses in every bus type, type A, type C, and type D. Um, we've now standardized on a CCS1 connector, uh, which um, they spoke a little bit about in the IC presentation. That allows you to charge with either level two charging or DC fast charging. We think this is pretty important 
you don't have to make a decision when you order the bus uh, about uh, do you want level two or level three DC fast charging. You can do either with that bus. It, be, it's, it comes standard. And then also uh, we announced this year that a vehicle grid capability is standard on all our buses. And uh, Mark Tran is going to talk more about V to G, but we think that's a pretty important attribute on a school bus to allow the possibility of getting some revenue uh, stream against uh, those assets. And then just recently we announced our 300th EV sale uh, that we've made since we've introduced the buses. So we sold 300 uh, electric school buses. We have about 220 of those delivered and the other are currently in production. So a pretty good start, we think. Uh, this will just kind of show you where we've deployed uh, these school buses and kind of show you a little bit about the growth that we've had thus far in electric school buses. If you look at that map, all the blue states are where we've uh, sold electric school buses that for 14 different states. Majority of those are in California. They were kind of the early adopters, as you can imagine, and have a lot of funding for that product in that part of the uh, U.S. Um, but we sold them in, in a lot of different climates, which I think is important to point, point out. Arizona, very high climates. Uh, Hawaii, obviously. Uh, but all the way up into New York and North Dakota, we actually have a bus running in West Far Fargo, North Dakota right now. So these buses work really, really well in all different climates. And uh, we have them operating right now all over the U.S. If you look to the right, that kind of shows the art sales growth since we introduced it. We introduced the bus late in 2018. We sold seven buses that year. 2019, about 58 buses. Uh, this year will be uh, very close to 200 school buses sold. And uh, we really think it's going to continue to grow pretty quick uh, over the next several years. Uh, for a lot of reasons, which uh, I'll kind of detail on this next screen. And a lot of these um, Amy talked about uh, in her opening comments, so I won't go into great detail, but this really is why we're seeing so much growth. Obviously, zero emissions is the most important part of that, having clean, clean air for our children. The reduced maintenance costs, which I'll detail here in just a little bit. Quiet operation, uh, really, uh, that's a pretty important um, benefit as well. A lot less sound pollution in the neighborhoods that these vehicles drive, safer driving for the uh, bus drivers as well because they are very quiet. A lot of grant funds available. Obviously, everybody's familiar with VW and the Mitigation Trust. A lot of states have carved out um, specific funding for electric school buses, and a lot of that is still going on all over the U.S., so a lot of growth related to a lot of money being spent in grant funds. Outstanding performance. Um, if you ever drove an electric vehicle of any type, electric car, you know that they have a lot of power, a lot of torque at very low RPMs. Same thing with our school bus. Uh, when you get the opportunity to drive it, I highly recommend it. I think you'd be impressed with the dr driving performance of our products. And then vehicle to grid technology is another reason. Uh, as that uh, is being, has been developed and now becoming a reality, that's a big reason why we're seeing a lot of growth and there'll be a lot more growth in the future because of this. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in Mark's presentation. Um, just want to kind of give you a snapshot of the components on an electric school bus. I won't go over these in detail just because limited on time here, but um, there isn't a whole lot to electric school bus, which, you know, we talked about the maintenance savings is because there aren't really many things to maintain. Obviously, you have your battery system that's located between uh, the front and rear axle uh, and the, between the frame rails. Uh, we have uh, two strings of uh, seven batteries, 14 total batteries. Uh, for 155 kilowatt hours. Uh, we are going to be increasing that in the very near future. Um, of course, you have the propulsion motor. We don't have a transmission. We uh, direct connect that to the drive axle uh, with a short drive shaft. Um, you have the thermal management system, another key component that really controls the temperature of the batteries and also provides um, uh, the heat for the, for the cabin. We have three electric heaters, one dedicated to our uh, batteries and two dedicated uh, to, to uh, running cabin heat. So I just want to kind of give you a snapshot of what that looks like. And the components are the same, whether you're talking about a type C bus or a type D bus. They're located a little bit in different, different locations depending on the model, but uh, the components are the same. Uh, we talked about maintenance savings uh, a little bit earlier, and I know IC also um, reviewed this on their presentation. 
Uh, and uh, what we're seeing so far from the buses in the market, it's about an 80% reduction in maintenance costs over a typical diesel bus. And for the reasons you can see on the screen, obviously a lot of uh, components that require maintenance here on the left side of the screen uh, for a diesel powertrain, uh, and some of those can be quite expensive. Of course, on electric drivetrain, um, very little to do. No lubricate and all, obviously, with electric motor. No transmission to service. No fuel filters. Uh, no exhaust. So you don't have to deal with DEF and DEF tank heads and all those fun things. And, of course, it didn't require an air filter as well. So you can see uh, real easily that uh, the savings are real and they're pretty significant. And uh, actually, um, Jason is going to talk about that a little bit more in detail on the products he's running already. So service and support, uh, obviously, that's a big part. If you buy electric bus, you want to know where to get it serviced. I know that's important for all our Texas customers. And uh, obviously, we have our Texas dealers who can support uh, with rush bus centers and their locations, mm -hmm. as well as our dealer out in the Panhandle and love that Blue Star bus sales. But uh, our product, um, our partner in this product is, uh, is Cummins. Uh, we use their uh, Cummins Power Drive 7000 system. Um, and uh, what, what we do is as soon as we sell a product into any part of the U.S., including Texas, the nearest Cummins location is trained a little in advance before that bus uh, is deployed to the school district. That way, as soon as the bus arrives, everyone is uh, well-trained to support that product going forward. So that's worked real well for us thus far. Obviously, a lot of Cummins distributor locations throughout the state and the U.S., so they've been a, a very valuable partner for us. Um, in the development of this product and product with their service and support. Oh, sorry, that uh, shouldn't have gone away. There we go. Um, and training as well. So I know everybody's interested in what training we offer from Bluebird. Uh, we, of course, offer uh, driver training, which uh, is essential. You know, really, if you want to maximize your range, it's important that you understand how to properly drive the vehicle so that you can maximize your range. We offer, uh, we have videos on driver training. Uh, we can do it in person. Our local dealer can provide driver training as well. We also have technician training. Uh, we've been doing quite a bit of this virtually lately, uh, but we do offer it in person. So you can understand all the EV components, uh, what maintenance is required, how it dif differs from a diesel bus. Uh, so we provide that um, from Bluebird through our Bluebird Academy. And we also offer first responder training what we think is important, we've had a lot of um, markets where we've deployed buses where uh, we've, uh, this has been requested. So we developed some formal first responder training so they can be familiar with the product and handle how to handle an electric school bus in the event of an accident or an emergency. So that is also available from Bluebird. Uh, so I know I went through that kind of quick, but I think what I'll go ahead and do, let me stop sharing my screen and I'll switch this over to uh, Mark Trahan from uh, from Nubi Corporation, who will tell you a little bit more about infrastructure and vehicle to grid. Thank you. I think I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. Sorry about that. Hello, everyone. So my name is Mark Trahan. I'm Vice President for Marketing at uh, Nuvi Corporation. We're based in uh, San Diego, California, um, but we have uh, offices around the world. We've actually been uh, doing vehicle to grid for about 10 years now. Um, we've uh, got fleets in Japan, uh, across Europe, and as well here in the United States. And we're working very closely with uh, school buses and with Bluebird at setting up vehicle to grid. Now, I wanna spend a few minutes just explaining the basics of vehicle to grid so that you have an understanding of what it is. Um, the real principle is that we can then control a battery that's inside an electric vehicle or a bus and make sure the energy flows in and out of the, the battery back onto the mains. And uh, what's important in this process is to be able to control the rate at which the energy goes in and out of that battery. And you do that through vehicle to grid chargers that are able to talk to the vehicle. And our software at Nuvi, because at the end we, we make a software that controls this rate of uh, charge and discharge. And then uh, we create what's called a virtual power plant. It's 
an aggregation, if you want. We take all these little batteries from the buses and we create a virtual power plant from which we deliver energy services to the grid. Now, those energy services can be given to an energy market, and we would make revenue on that energy market. Or we can make savings on the meter at which the buses are actually plugged into. Um, the principle of vehicle to grid is that those revenues are then shared with the owners and the operators of the school buses, which makes a vehicle to grid bus less expensive to own than a regular electric bus. So we believe vehicle to grid is really gonna enable uh, the nation to have more and more electric buses at a lower cost. And it's really through this principle of sharing the energy inside these batteries. Now, there are a few key things that are important in vehicle to grid. You always will have the energy to drive. We are not going to use the energy inside the bus so that when you show up in the morning, your drivers don't have energy. That is the main requirement for this battery is that the energy for driving is always there. And our algorithms make sure of that. And another also myth about vehicle to grid is the battery degradation. Um, it is not the cause of battery degradation inside um, an electric vehicle. We've been doing this for 10 years. We've observed uh, a lot of the degradation going on. The main causes are usually calendar aging, fast charging, driving, but vehicle to grid actually uh, might improve your battery life in certain cases, especially if your bus is sitting for a long period of time under the heat, for example. This is where vehicle to grid turns on. It will turn on some of the cooling systems inside your batteries. It will take care of your batteries at the same time. Just a few photos to make it real. Um, we've been doing vehicle to grid with uh, small EVs, such as these uh, little Nissan Leafs plugged into the snow. This works in hot or cold climates. Um, and we've also been operating uh, school buses in different modes in AC or DC, as Albert was explaining. Uh, you can plug in the buses with uh, both of these, uh, e either level two chargers or a fast charger. How do we control all this? We control this through, through software. Um, so there are interfaces so that fleet managers at the schools are able to view the charge of every single bus. So you, if you look at that dashboard on the bottom left, those little uh, dials are the charge rate, uh, the state of charge of every single bus you might have. Now those buses are not necessarily on the parking lot right outside uh, your office. So you might not be able to, to visually go and check the buses, but with this software capability or through mobile application, you're able to view at a distance what the charge rates are, uh, be reassured of them. You can manage the charge at any time. You can take over control of the charge if you need to. Uh, otherwise that software of course will do everything that's needed to make sure that you have the, the charge you need in the morning but if you've got unplanned trips you can also force some charges um, if all of a sudden you realize these buses need a bit of extra juice at an, any potential time so we render a high level um, control system as well for the users there and anytime we'll provide dashboard reports on the actual use of energy we uh, package of course a lot of that um, with the, the cost of the bus so you can, um, through Bluebird, have an overall package that includes uh, the, the leasing as well as the V2G revenues, which will make your lease cost uh, more affordable than if uh, you didn't have V2G. Just the uh, last slide here on the charges, um, both on the AC side and the DC side. Uh, of course, the, there's a difference in terms of the installations. Um, the power levels you, you need to, to install these and how fast they will charge your buses. So depending on the routes and how much energy you need, uh, you might have to decide on, on which uh, ones you want to do. Uh, the real, I think, benefits from vehicle to grid are around the 60 kilowatt charger, which is a powerful charger with a CCS connector and would enable the maximum amount of the vehicle to grid activity. We've got lots more information on uh, our website, nuvi.com. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me. I've put my email into the chat if you've got additional questions.
but I'm going to hand it uh, back over to you. And thanks a lot for inviting us today. Thank you, Mark. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen again uh, so we can look at uh, Jason's information and allow him to unmute and review what we're seeing here. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, Albert. And, and thank you, Amy. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for reaching out to me and uh, seeing exactly how our, how our buses have been going. Uh, we are the first electric school buses in Texas. Uh, it's very interesting to me that the first two letters in Everman ISD are EV. I'm just glad that Event Texas decided not to get electric buses this year so we can claim it first. So uh, that being said, we ordered these buses back in February. Um, I will say uh, John Ruben Kinnick over at Rush, at Rush Bus really, really did help push this along and get it moving. Uh, the buses that we ordered are a seven, they're actually listed as a 78 passenger flat nose rear engine style D bus. Uh, we did get these on the Volkswagen grant and TCQ mitigation. The, uh, the, we actually seated them for 72 passengers uh, because we kind of hope that people are gonna wanna come look at the buses. And instead of having to drive to find them, they can just come down here to Everman. We're just, just south of Fort Worth and a little south, southwest of Dallas. So I'm inviting anybody that wants to come look at them. I'm here about 24 hours a day. So uh, I want people to come look at them. They are, they are an amazing bus. I actually drove one this morning because I had to go drive her out because we've got four drivers out with COVID. So I have, I have personal experience of getting to actually drive the buses. They are extremely powerful and you cannot drive it the exact same way as a regular bus, but uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's the advantages of an electrified, 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 electrified school bus over a diesel bus. So uh, I told Albert, I put some information together and this is very similar information that what I presented to our school board in June of 2019. So uh, at the time in June, 2019, we were paying uh, uh, about $2 and I think it came out as like $2 and 40 cents a gallon for diesel. Uh, we've actually almost saved almost a whole dollar worth of diesel. So my examples had to be modified a little bit, but these are the numbers that I've come up with. Uh, and they, please don't think they're inflated in any way. These are actual prices where I've looked at our bills where we paid for some things. But uh, I know that the biggest advantage to using the electric bus obviously is for, is looking at the advantages uh, in the, you know, going green and the best thing for our ecosystem. I'm an ex-science teacher, an ex-high school environmental science teacher. And it's just, it's amazing how things have, have uh, come to fruition. In 1998, I predicted we'd have electric school buses on the bu uh, school buses on the road by 2020, and my kids actually laughed at me and said that's not even really a year. So, uh, what I did was I put these numbers together, obviously with the fuel savings. Uh, now, again, everybody's routes are a little bit different. We did put these buses uh, on the bus that I drove this morning, covered about 40 miles yesterday. Uh, we do have a range. Uh, just a few weeks ago, before the before the cold front came through, uh, we were getting a range of about 90 to 100 miles on each bus. It's really according to the driver. If the, and it's really according to their driving style, but it was ranging between about 88 and about 100 to 102 miles uh, between full charges. Uh, when we start, when we were running the air conditioner, it would drop it to about 90. Uh, so I want to say about 10 percent. Now with the heaters going, it's dropping, it dropped about 15%. So I'm getting a range of about 80 to 85 miles on a, on a, fuel, on a uh, fuel recharge. And so uh, you can look there as far as the fuel savings. Uh, I predict, I, I'm looking at, at a, about $1.50 a gallon. We're gonna spend about $50,000 if the price of diesel doesn't go up. Uh, with today's number right now, which everybody knows with inflation, most likely the price of diesel is going to go up, but that's a minimum number of about $50,000 over the, over the lifespan, which is about 14 years. Uh, and I said 14 years because I come from the old, uh, I've been in transportation for a number of years. 
It used to be about 15 years and about 250,000 miles on a bus. It's now dropping to about 14 years and about 200,000 miles for a bus just because of all the uh, after treatment stuff that goes on to lessen the amount of emissions. Oil filters there, you can see how much we're spending about 14 years. Uh, the DEF fluid is huge. Uh, the DPF cleaning, uh, you'll see my down in the third column where I say how, how often. Well, the DPF and DOC replacement, the turbo replacement, the fuel injector replacement, at some point during the life of that diesel bus, you will be replacing these if the bus goes a full 14 years. Uh, so and uh, these are numbers where I've actually taken out the number of having to take the bus and send it to a dealer to get fixed. This is our mechanic doing that work. So over the lifetime of a bus, we're looking at about a minimum of about $100,000 for the price of the bus just in regular maintenance. This does not include the engine replacement, which right now uh, is about 40,000, between 35 and 40,000 for a Cummins replacement. Transmission replacement, us doing it ourselves, is about, uh, about $8,000. Uh, to send it off is going to use tack on another four to include towing or fuel. Uh, so right now, our best estimate for uh, the lifetime of the bus for the EV bus, obviously there's some, there's going to be some maintenance that comes along, but I don't know what those numbers are. So I don't want to, I'm really just comparing all the diesel stuff to the, we don't have diesel stuff anymore. So uh, when you look at just the fuel saving, that's about a 90% fuel savings. And so, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Jason, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we need to open it up for some questions. Gotcha. Uh, a few minutes for that um, before we move on to the audience. Okay. So uh, please feel free to unmute your phones and start asking questions. Okay, uh, our presentation, but Amy, anybody has a question. Well, I'm putting in my email address. If anybody needs to ask me anything, uh, email me and I'll be happy to start my cell phone number uh, because the more buses, more EV buses go on the road, the cheaper we're going to buy when we buy some more. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do the same, Jason. I'll add my email address as well in case anybody has any questions they think of after, after we're done. And, and we'll have some time at the end for questions. Uh, so if no, no questions, um, we'll just move on to Encore uh, with Eric Daniels. I think you're muted. Eric, uh, are you able to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, to the NC, uh, but to the COG here, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Eric Daniels. I'm an engineer with Encore. Um, and, and today this is about a guide of, of how to work, um, a guide for working with Encore. <clears throat> Um, so our agenda is just an introduction to myself, um, the project submission process, um, some Q&A, and then there's an appendix. Um, I'll, I'll also have my email and phone number in the chat because um, this is the really fun part of my job uh, is, is talking about, uh, about this, this emerging technology and, and, and really how cool it is. Having some problems switching to slides here. Um, so my name is Eric Daniels. I'm a graduate of Lamar University. I'm an industrial engineer. Um, I do special project engineering um, for our new construction management group. Um, so that that would include um, we've done some big box um, uh, alternative energy projects, as well as uh, some large convenience store gas stations, um, 
um, some of your large, uh, larger um, retail shipping companies. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really growing fast and it's really exciting. Um, so, so who, so who Encore is, we are a, a, a wires only transmission and distribution company. So we don't generate energy and uh, we don't sell energy. We just transmit uh, and, and distribute it to, uh, to commercial and residential. So, so, so things that Encore needs um, from a prospective customer um, is, 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 right, first, who, you, who are you? Um, so the customer contacts for that project, that would be um, the company rep, um, any engineering firms, MEP, electrical, civil, um, and, and any contractors, your electricians and, and, and so forth and so on for that. Uh, the next would be the what and the where, um, the type of project. Is this going to be just the implementation of e-vehicles, or will this uh, accompany with um, some warehousing um, and, and garage space as well? Um, also, the, the type of electric vehicles, um, as well as the charger type. And finally, um, it, it's the when, right? And these are your project milestone dates. Um, so right when you're going to break ground, um, any temporary power needs, um, your, your, your charging need date, um, as well as, you know, the arrival dates of your EVs and your chargers. And, and what was something that was covered in an earlier uh, presentation is, is the overall growth timeline. Um, you know, is this, is this something that y'all are just piloting or is, is there an actual a fiscal plan to, to grow your fleet and diversify um, over the foreseeable future? Um, so it's, it's a really straightforward, it's a really an easy process. Um, I am your contact for Encore. Um, I, I will be handling all uh, electric vehicle implementation projects across our entire service center. Um, and, and what I've included in our, in our appendix is, 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 is those steps to the actual steps of on our website, submitting a project, um, and then our additional documentation that we require. Um, these are site plans and these are uh, your, your one line diagrams and, and, and the filling out of our, of our Encore load sheet. Um, and, and so that that's really the short of um, of our of my presentation. Um, I, I have these appendix items here. Here's the how to access our portal and 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 some steps that move through this. I'd love to share uh, this document with y'all. Um, if anybody is is um, is is interested, um, so it's it's pretty straightforward, right? You just go to our commercial site and. We'll just step through each of these these um, these windows here, um, construction and development, and then your registration of it, and and then you begin to enter uh, some credential information to have an account. You can um, follow all of your accounts uh, through this website, um, and then you can track all your construction projects um, on this website. Um, and so, as I previously mentioned, um, our onboard load sheet. This is really goes back to the who, what, when, where, and and why. Um, you know, your contact information, um, as well as your electrical requirements, um, the type of voltage you're requesting, um, any any additional equipment you may be requesting, um, and then information for for the actual charger and vehicle information, as well as the growth. Um, so I kind of sped through that, but, but that's really um, all I have to talk about. I really wanted to, um, to, to leave the time open to um, questions as much as possible. Um, does anybody have any, any questions? Eric, I have a question on behalf of, of perhaps everybody. And just to, to make a point, this model um, 
for the Encore Service territory is going to be most applicable to anybody in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, because I know we have a couple districts from other parts of the state on the phone. How far in advance of the initial electric bus deployment should the district contact you? That's a great question, Lori. Um, so, so a rule of thumb is, is about six months for us to complete any, um, any design, any coordination, any planning um, for, for that project. And, and, and while this is kind of a little difficult to understand, for each additional megawatt that you're going to add, I would add one month to that timeline. So um, if we're talking six months, and you have a four megawatt project, that, that's all of a sudden, that's about a 10 month lead time that is a safe timeline for us to um, plan um, along with yourselves, uh, the project, design it, um, order materials, which is, is, the, is the longest lead time to that. You know, trans, transformers for these projects um, are about a 16 month lead, or sorry, 16 week lead time, excuse me. Um, so, so just, so just for the transformer itself, um, you're looking be about three to four months on, on that transformer as well as the construction phase. Um, and so I, there are some, 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 some deep details as, as we move through our tariff, which is, is our menu, um, and, um, of, of how your projects are funded. Um, and, and so so that gets into the weeds pretty quick, but um, but I, I'd love the opportunity to talk with with any of you on here um, about that offline or 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 another appointment. So did that answer the question, Lori. Yes, thank you. Just for a point of reference, um, I don't know if this is a question for Jason or Eric, how many kilowatts or megawatts was the charging installation for the Everman project? I wasn't ready for that question. I'm not sure what, uh, I need to go in and look. Albert, would you know that answer? Or Eric, would you know? My understanding is it, it's, it's relatively low, um, is that we added an additional, I believe, 75 kilowatts. Right, added three transformers. Three transformers. Um, I, I believe we added three 25 kW transformers. So that would be um, 0 0.075 megawatts. So that's, 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 a, that's a fairly simple project for us, us to do. And, 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 and it's something we can do uh, much faster than a six month timeline. Um, but, but for planning purposes, um, uh, six months is always a good, a, a good timeline for the customer itself to, um, to understand the process and their needs um, as well as Encore to meet, meet your needs. I will say just kudos to Eric. Uh, I think we started communicating with Encore around June and uh, was, we're making great headway June, July, August. And then the, of course, the epidemic, the pandemic came. And then, you know, the only thing that make it worse was a hurricane. And uh, <laughs> they ended up sending all the Encore guys to and It just kind of delayed it, but it actually, it was literally days apart from when they were up and ready and when we got the all three electric buses here. So, you know, it just, it all fell, it all fell together. So thank you, Eric. Yeah. Eric, I have kind of a, just a general question about costs. Um, where is the, where does it delineate between, you know, Encore paying for infrastructure versus the ISD paying for the infrastructure? So, so Encore's responsibility is to serve the customer. And so there is an allowable budget um, that um, majority of projects fall under and, and it's $168 per demand of kilowatt. So if you had um, a megawatt, which is a thousand kilowatts, right? That'd be a $168,000 budget for Encore. Um, that would be to serve your project. Um, if there are any off-site needs, um, 
that would fall under on course capital investments. Those are also things that we need to do to serve you. So those are on core costs. Um, as far as the cost to the customer, this really comes with, um, it's all customer initiated, but customer initiated requests that are more aesthetic. So, so, so those, those dollar amounts are, are, our our cost to serve. So that's what the rate payers pay. So, so if, if a customer wanted to relocate facilities or relocate poles, um, and, and maybe clean up the face of a, of a, of a project that would, that would, those would be costs that would go on to the customer. But as far as, um, standard equipment to serve the customer, whether it be overhead or, or, or underground transformation, that, that, that's covered in that budget. Did that answer the question, Amy? I, I ramble and go on tangents, so. <laughs> um. I was trying to unmute myself, sorry. Um, it's hard to find my cursor. Uh, yes, and there, if you could look in the chat real quick, Eric, there's a question for you there. Uh, I could read it to you, but it may be easier for you to read it to yourself. So, um, so added load projects would fall under the same um, category as a new serve. Um, you, the kilowatt demand budget would, would only apply to what you're adding. So if you had a 500 kW transformer and you needed a 1,000 kW transformer, you would only get 500 kVA demand um, for that budget. Um, and if the project includes backfeeding, this is excellent, and thank you for the reminder. Um, any of the, the, the vehicle to building would not require any additional work from Encor, but vehicle to grid would, because um, that's where we would move from um, a delta Y configuration for all of you electricians and engineers out there to a YY. And the YY transformer allows you to backfeed onto the system. Um, so those transformers, while they, they do have a, a, a slightly larger cost, um, that, that's not anything that would um, make you pay out of pocket on principle. It would still be applied into that, into that budget, if that makes sense, James. And we are officially open for all questions to anyone uh, that has presented in the webinar. So um, feel free to unmute or chat your question just to anyone. While well, everybody's thinking of questions. Um, or trying to unmute themselves, I will point out that uh, Savannah chatted a link to a survey into the chat box. We would really, really appreciate it if everybody could click on that link before we end and just give us a little bit of feedback on the webinar. We have two more coming. Um, and then we have an entire year work of webinars probably in front of us in 2021. Uh, so we want to make sure that we organize things that fit your needs. So um, if you would please give us some some feedback there, we'd appreciate it. Um, there is a question that just popped up on how is there, oh, well, I wish I knew the answer to this. Is there a sense of how many ISDs in North Texas are looking to add electric school buses? I don't know if that's a question for us. Um, does, does the OEMs that presented today may have a better sense of that than, than we do in terms of just you may not be able to say which districts you're talking to, but if you could speak to how many districts you're talking to, um, would love to hear uh, your thoughts. I, I actually do not know I, if, if he's still on the call, possibly uh, possibly John Rubin Kenny, who's the uh, territory manager for North Texas for our local dealer rush bus centers, may have some comments on that on how many districts have been discussing electric with him or requesting quotes up to this point. John, are you still on? He may not be, so. 
I don't, well, I'll just so, kind of chime in right now. Uh, John, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like he's there. He, uh, John and I have been kind of communicating. Yeah, I've told him, please give my number and my, help, my, my, my phone number and my email to anybody that's got questions. I've talked to two so far. Uh, there's a couple more that I'll probably be reaching out to in the next few days. Just, you know, don't want to feel, I don't want to pressure anybody, but I'm not a car salesman. All I do is just give them the facts. So, uh, but there are two, two other school districts right now that have talked to me about it. Well, plus Chris also. I know Chris down in uh, where he is, he's, that's definitely something. I see Chris more than anybody else. And I think that's, you know, we've had, Chris and I've had some good conversations of, of you know, where, where, what might be best for them. I guess three school districts right now, possibly five. I know that there is um, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of questions. I think the the key is really how serious that interest is, and um, who can really afford it at the moment. Truly, uh, because capital budgets and operating budgets tend to be in separate silos at many districts. School districts that are on the phone, I would highly recommend that y'all get your capital budget people and your operating budget people to start talking to each other when it comes to the topic of electric school buses that can make a big difference in the investment. And we'll talk at length about funding at the third webinar in January. I know there was a question about the Volkswagen settlement in particular, TCEQ will be one of the presenters in January and I know everybody wants to hear from them. So you'll hear it direct from the horse's mouth then as well as some others that um, can offer some, some different types of financing type options. Um, I know this is Chris. I, I want to add something else, if you don't mind. But first of all, thank you all so much for setting this up. This is awesome. Uh, one of our, I mean, our main thing right now is to find the correct funding. One thing we have done, and I work with Austin Energy down here closely, and also TCEQ. One of the things that uh, we are in communication also with one of the representatives, because uh, legislation is going to start, now, how well they're going to proceed or bring up the idea of alternate fuel or electric buses. But there is a representative, she's seriously thinking about it to, to bring it up in, the, in this upcoming legislation for funding for the alternate fuel and especially electric buses. But I do want to thank you all, and I can't wait for the meeting in January to talk about funding. Um, so, so we go Friday. Um, so thank you. And I'll, I'll just say, uh, just for those who are wondering about the, the costs and uh, how it's all taken care of, uh, I know talking to Amy and Lori both uh, and, and Savannah uh, about uh, the, all the different grant monies that are out there, uh, I will say that financially, uh, we are going to be very well off. And uh, we have not made a public announcement yet as to our electric buses. We're still, I, I want to get the buses completely ready. I want license plates on them. We still haven't got, I still want our uh, video camera system installed. And so I want it to be perfect when we, when we show them off. I will say that uh, we, we did come out. We have bought all three buses, which was just right over a million dollars. But I will say that when we get the grant money back in that we qualified for, we're going to turn around and I'm going to be handing a check to my superintendent for about $960,000. So uh, our buses came out to a net cost of about $70,000 a piece. If that was a diesel school bus, it would be about 125 to 130,000 for that bus. So the net difference uh, we're saving we're saving just right at $60,000 per bus uh, for the cost. Plus we're gonna save about, uh, about four to 6,000 per year just in diesel. And that's not including all the different filters and oils and all that stuff. So this is, I know that the, the right thing to do is environmentally get the EV buses on the road, but superintendents jobs, our, their job is to get as much, as much for the kids financially as possible and try to stretch that dollar. And to save this much money 
uh, and do the right thing environmentally, it was just a no brainer for me. And that's why uh, Amy, Lori, Savannah, everybody at the COG just really helped me connect with people extremely quickly. Uh, our superintendent signed it in September. It did take about five months for TCEQ to come back to finally approve it. Uh, it took us more, from what I understand, longer than anybody getting propane buses or CNG buses, but part of it was because it was new technology for everybody. And it's just gonna take people to just look at financially how much better we're gonna be off environmentally, how much get better we're gonna be off. And uh, where we're located in Dallas-Fort Worth area, just south, we're gonna be a showcase district. So please, I will give you my cell phone number. I'll give you my address. I'll meet you here on a Saturday if you want to. So just let me know. And that's all I have. Thank you, Jason. We really appreciate y'all's leadership and having the champion for the state of Texas right here in our backyard. It's great. Does anyone else have any questions? We're willing to, to hang out here for a few more minutes. I see a question from James. Um, somewhat off topic, I've heard that in neighborhoods where distribution grid is weak, there can be prohibitive costs for installing solar PV. Also, what does the grid capability studies cost into play? Maybe better to follow up. So to, to answer um, the, the, the DG, um, the distributive generation um, question, um, those, those costs are um, a part of that allowable budget that I spoke to, um, that study goes into. Um, as, as far as, um, that's one of those, it, it is one of those topics where um, it, it, does take, it does take an engineer to dig into the system and to do a study um, to, to know um, what's needed to facilitate in that area. So it is a little difficult to say which areas or um, how often that comes up. Um, so, but I, I, I'd love to, um, I'd love to chat with you more about it offline if you, if you have some time. Jason, there's a question for you in the chat. Um, okay, you just answered it. Thank you. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I guess we could actually end almost on time. I'm, I'm surprised that <laughs> uh, it's been a great webinar. Thank you all so much for participating. Thank you to all our presenters. And uh, we look forward to everyone attending uh, webinar two and three. Uh, webinar two is in two weeks. And then mid-January, we'll have that last webinar where we'll highlight uh, funding. So thank you very much. Oh, and all you presenters, you. If, you, if you would wouldn't mind sending us your presentations, and we'll we'll help uh, distribute that to the attendees. Thank you. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.